Welcome to the Startup Grind. So, my name is Stacy, and this is Startup Grind for Kalamazoo. So, how about a big round of applause? And actually, the way we do it for our Startup Grind at the conferences is to standing ovation. So, how about a standing ovation and applause for Nancy? Let's just start at the beginning. How about that? Okay. Well, what um what led you to like what was the beginning that you would say that led you to the winemaking that you're at now? So I'm a graduate of Purdue University and I was a food science student there. And Purdue hosts the Indian International Wine Competition and I got involved right after my sophomore year with the wine competition. Kind of one of those things that you take for granted that you go to the grocery store and just buy wine off the shelf and take it home and drink it. You don't really think of what goes into what was behind it by any means. So that's kind of where I was at. And I'm like, all right, this wine thing. Um, my parents are actually here. and They drink wine on the holidays and it wasn't a huge part of our lives by any means. So I learned as I went and I was very involved with the wine competition. I went out to California and I did a harvest by recommendation of a professor of mine, uh, two professors and the director of the Indiana Marketing Council and I still loved it. We worked 16 hour days and they said it's a love it or hate it industry and it truly is. Of the 18 interns that were there, two of us are still in the wine industry today. And I graduated and I happened to send my resume up here to St. Julian and been here ever since. So you were out in California, you were mentioning that, so why be in Michigan then? Why, why come here when you could have been in California? Um, because it's Michigan. We all love this wonderful weather that we're having today. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, I grew up in the Midwest, so most of my life I was in Indiana, born in Illinois, grew up in Indiana, so I'm a Midwest girl at heart. California was awesome. I thought I would have to go back there to actually get a job in winemaking. Lucky enough, I found a job here. I knew I'd always want to be back here in the Midwest um, in the long run. It just happened a little bit sooner than what I thought. Um, another reason my parents were on my case as a senior in college, worried that I was never going to find a job in winemaking. And so they said, you know, send your resume out, send your resume out. I'm like, yeah, I'll get a job, I'll get a job. And, um, luckily, I actually did, so, um, but I'm here, and I love Michigan, so it's one of the last states, I guess, in the Midwest that we didn't venture in growing up, so. Well, so what is kind of the history of winemaking in this area? Is it, is it relatively newer? So, um, geez, winemaking goes back hundreds and hundreds of years, but in Michigan, our industry is still quite young compared to some of the industries, especially like California. Um, St. Julian, this is our 95th year of business, so we've been around 95 years. We started in 1921 in Windsor, Ontario, and then we have prohibition here in the United States. So whatever industry that wineries had or breweries had back then, most of them went out of business. Um, we moved from Windsor, Ontario over to Detroit across the border as soon as Prohibition was over. Michigan was the first state in Prohibition and we were the first state out of Prohibition. Um, back then there was, it was a billion dollar industry bootlegging actually liquor across the country borders. Um, but a lot of rich history here. Uh, grapes have been growing here in this region for a number of years. Just south of the winery is Welch's. So it's their third largest grape processing plant. So most of the grapes planted in Michigan are Concords for Welch's grape juice. So it was just very idealistic to make wine from those as well. So after Prohibition, we were over in Detroit. We were there for two years and they would truck all the grapes from the Southwest Michigan portion of, of the state over to Detroit. We didn't have I-94 obviously back then. So it was quite a trek to get the grapes from one side of the state to the other. So they decided to move the winery where the grapes were. And so we are have been in our location since 1936. Okay, so I guess, 
go back to um, being in school, okay, is it, uh, when you're learning about winemaking, is that, is it the science that you're learning? Or what is it considered? So winemaking is part science and part art. Um, some, winer, some winemakers only look at the artistic flair of it, and some winemakers only go by the numbers and it's solely scientific to them. Um, a lot of winemakers have been business people, bankers, lawyers, um, doctors. Winemakers have stemmed from several different degrees, um, experiences throughout life. A lot of the newer winemakers are coming from programs that are specifically related to winemaking. Um, but there is a lot of science. It's good to know the science behind winemaking just so you, if there's a problem, you're better trained to evaluate and kind of troubleshoot. But a lot of the finishing and the final flair of the product is an artistic edge to it. So how do you look at it then? How do you decide on things? A little bit of both. Okay. <laughs> I, I like numbers. I, being a food science major, my brain is very scientific, and so I like the numbers. But the numbers, if I look at the chemistry of a grape and look at, um, I know there are some chemistry majors in here, if I look at acidity levels and pH levels and if there's any volatile acids in uh, the grape juice or the wines, the numbers can be exactly the same year after year after year but the wine will be completely different because it's a agricultural product and what mother nature does every single year will affect the variability of our end product so with our wonderful weather that we have here in michigan the cool part about my job is it changes every single year so mother nature always throws something new at us that's a new challenge what was the first wine um there's one that's named after you, right? Yes. Was that the first? Was that the first one that you worked on, as far as uh, in your current job? Um, so I started St. Julian back in 2002 as part of the winemaking team. I took over as head winemaker <coughs> in 2010. Um, so back in 2010, from there are a lot of wines that St. Julian produces that will never change. If you guys have ever tasted St. Julian wines, you're probably familiar with the red, white, and blue heron. Every time you taste red, white, and blue heron, we want to make sure it tastes exactly the same. So in internally, we call those recipe wines that Mother Nature will have them vary a little bit, but the overall end product, we want to make sure it's the same and consistent year after year. Something like a vintage wine, uh, like our Riesling or a Cabernet, it will vary with different vintages, so I worked on that. Um, but new products, um, Sweet Nancy is the product that Stacy's referring to. Um, I think that might have been one of the first newest new labels that we do. We do all kinds of new labels now, so I like to be creative. It's a fun part of my job. So I guess maybe even taking what you do in a day, but how do you go from, oh, you know, I'm going to do wine to this is what I'm going to do? A lot of it is what Mother Nature gives us. Um, sometimes it's what my boss tells me to do. Okay. <laughs> uh, that's how Sweet Nancy came about. Uh, for geez, six months he said, make a wine and, and call it Sweet Nancy and you figure it out and you make it. And I'm like, well, I make all the wines here, so I'm not really sure what you're asking me to do. And he said, make a wine and we're gonna call it Sweet Nancy. You figure it out, sign the label, do all this stuff. So I kind of refused for do it so we figured it out and made a new wine that was different than everything else in our portfolio um, we have set over 70 different products that we work with at st julian from still wines to sparkly wines sparkly juices we have a whole new line of spirits coming out so to create a new product of something that we haven't done is not always an easy task but we're ever evolving and changing so there are new things that are coming out, but and that's the challenge is to make something different that we don't already have. If it's not Mother Nature and it's not your boss, are there other factors that help you decide what to make? The customer. <laughs> A lot of what we do can be customer driven as well. Uh, consumers will say, hey, we tried this wine at this winery. Can you guys do something like that? Um, we do that. Um, 
if we have an opportunity to work with a new fruit source, we have a strawberry wine coming out in July, and so we worked with a, a new strawberry grower. Um, we're actually in developmental stages for making a blueberry balsamic vinegar um, because we work with Leduc blueberries, if you guys are familiar with them out in the Pawpaw area. So sometimes it's driven by supply, sometimes it's driven by demand, most of the time it's driven by the boss. <laughs> is, is there any that have been your favorite? Depends on the day. <laughs> <laughs> it's like asking which child is your favorite. Um, they're, all my, they're all my little babies per se, but um, we, one of my favorites that we do right now is a Sauvignon Blanc that's grown right here in Michigan. Everything that we do is grown right here in our backyards, as we say, so in Southwest Michigan. What, what kind of, if you can explain it in a, a short enough time frame, what kind of process is it? So what kind of process is the Winemaking? Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we source all our fruit from Southwest Michigan. So being beer in Iberian County is very important to us. Our tagline is Italian roots, Michigan soil. Italian roots, our founder was from Italy. Michigan soil, because everything's grown in our backyard. Um, anybody can buy grapes or buy wine or juice from California and make a great wine. We all know that because California has great wine. But the real challenge is to do it right here in our backyard. So we work with local growers to grow the grapes. We harvest them, bring them into the winery, uh, crush, press them out. We have juice, and then we add some yeast and some other stuff, let it ferment away. Um, and we do some clarification and racking and fining and stabilization and all kinds of stuff to make sure the wine is beautifully clear when it goes into the bottle. Um, we adjust it to make sure the sweetness level is perfect and design labels, get it in the bottle for your enjoyment. In, well, a, in a nutshell. In a nutshell, <laughs> okay. So uh, as you're doing this, like adjusting something like sweetness, is that more tasting or is that more the chemical? Well, a, little bit of, a little bit of both. Um, different vintage years, the acidity levels will be different in the grapes because of the weather. So the warmer the weather, the less acidic a grape varietal will be. Uh, that's why we have really nice white aromatic wines here in Michigan because we're considered a cool climate. So the grapes actually will hold on to their acid as they ripen. Somewhere like California is warm climate in Napa Valley, you don't see a lot of Rieslings produced out in Napa Valley. There are some, I don't want to say there's not any, because there are some wineries making them, but it's not that grape varietal that they stand proud upon. It's something like Cabernet Sauvignon that needs a lot of warm heat to get really nice and ripe and juicy. Drop those acid out because you don't want a red wine that is very tart on your palate. You want it to be a little bit more mellow, um, complementing your food, where as a red wine, um, as a white wine, you do want it to have that nice crisp acidity. So balancing that out, a lot of it is taste, um, but numbers do give us a good starting point. Okay. So talk more about being a head, head winemaker and also uh, the fact that you're the first, are you still the only female winemaker in Michigan? There are a few now. Okay, well, that's good. <laughs> We are definitely uh, a minority in the wine world, not just in Michigan, but all over. Um, actually, in production, there's just there are two women. Um, we have a lady that works on our bottling line and myself, so we always joke around that we're the only two girls at work. Um, but there are a few other female winemakers in the state of Michigan. Shady Lane Winery actually just hired a female winemaker, or promoted a female winemaker. Um, Holly Bursling is at Sand Hill Crane, Deb Bergdorf is with Bergdorf Winery, um, and there have been uh, far and few in between that have come and gone uh, in our state. But it's like that in California too. It's most winemakers that you'll find across the U.S. or even over all over the world are, are men. Um, but more and more women are getting into it every day. Um, they say women pay attention to detail a little bit better. Um, I don't know if that's the case for everybody, but uh, but having our palate pay attention to some of those finer details, I think at least in our winery, um, has been very beneficial 
from the aspect of our previous winemakers that have been there. Okay. And I guess, uh, what is a typical day like? <laughs> um, depends on the time of year. So right now we're doing a lot of barrel work and bottling. Um, the, so I guess I'll start from the standpoint of harvest. Most people's fiscal years start in January. Ours starts August 1st. And that's when we are getting ready to ramp up for harvest. Uh, grape harvest here in Michigan starts usually early September. It can start in late August depending on the season if it's warm enough. Um, so we are harvesting grapes September, October. Fermentations are happening. Um, we do all the nice racking of wines after fermentation, clarification. We put wine down in barrels. Uh, before we can put the current vintage year down in barrels, we actually have to rack all of last year's wine out. So usually that happens in January and February. So for instance, this past January and February, we were taking the 2014 wines out of barrels and putting the newest vintage 2015 down to barrels. So they can sit down there and age for a good 12 to 14 months, depending on the wine and how it tastes. Um, once those wines come out of barrels, then we have to blend if we need to. Um, we do some adjusting, we do a lot of bottling. Um, we are expanding our distillation, so we have been working on prepping some gin, rum, uh, we have a cherry brandy, an apple brandy, and a 10 year aged cognac brandy uh, that are actually being released this weekend. So the last several weeks we've been doing final distillations and final blendings of those. Uh, but we're a large company, so a lot of wineries this time of year, once they finally get everything into the bottle, they kind of have a lull. They, they focus on their tasting room efforts and connecting with the customer. We do that too at St. Julian, but we're large enough that there's always something going on in back. So we're continually bottling wines. We do, for instance, 12,000 cases of blue hair in a year. We don't bottle that all at once. We'll bottle 2,000 cases every single month. So we're constantly putting together blends of wine to get in the bottle for the customer. Okay. Well, I'm going to start asking, does anybody in the audience have questions? Just bring the microphone out. I don't need the microphone. I don't think so. yeah. How do you, uh, you know, I understand uh, the vintage wines, and those are different every year, but your uh, standard bread and butter that you try to keep the same. I mean, if, if the grapes are going to be so varied, which I can understand the acidity and everything else, how, how do you try to keep that flavor the same? A lot of blending. So different varieties will produce different things every single year. Um, but we can vary that by how we stop fermentations. So we don't necessarily ferment everything to dry. If we leave a little bit of residual sugar in there, it'll balance out the acid levels. So by chemistry, a wine might be sweeter last year versus this year, but to the consumer, it will taste the same because we will uh, change that sweetness level by adding some fresh pressed juice back to the wine and sometimes sugar. Some of our wines we do add sugar, the ones that are very sweet. Uh, we have a new wine out called Sweet Revenge. I call it Kool-Aid in a glass because it's like grape Kool-Aid. It's very, very sweet and we have to add sugar back to that or else it would have no alcohol in it whatsoever, so. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay, but from, let's say from, from one year to the next, to make it taste the same, I mean, how, how do you determine it tastes the same as if I the taste, or is there a, 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 lot a test of it, that you do? We, we do testing on the grapes, so every year we do. Um, Mother Nature is very challenging, so the, actually the last two vintages, 2014 and 15, have been quite small. 2014, we had such a harsh winter, we barely had any grapes actually come into the winery, so the variability on the chemistry was quite different. So we do run analysis. We do a lot of wet chemistry, it's called. So we're running uh, titrations and, and checking to see what different levels are. And from those numbers, we can adjust accordingly. But a lot of it's by taste, too. But certain grape varieties will taste very characteristically similar year after year, vintage after vintage. Cabernet Sauvignon always tastes like Cabernet Sauvignon. Does it taste different from every producer? Of course, because that's the artistic flair that 
uh, a winemaker will put on it, just like a painter will paint a little bit differently than the next painter, or a, someone that works as with pottery, how they work with the wheel is much different than the next person next to them. But if someone's making a dinner plate, it's still a dinner plate, but it might look a little bit different. That's what winemaking is, and that's what winemakers do, and that's what our job is, to taste and make sure everything is, if it's supposed to be Cabernet in the bottle, it's Cabernet, or if it's supposed to be blue heron in the bottle, we can blend and use different percentages of different grape varieties to make sure it tastes exactly the same. So if I use 10% of save all one year and the next year I might have to use 35% but it's a lot of it goes back to the palette of what a trained winemaker would do. So I understand that you're also experimenting with um, other fl fruits but have you considered something a little more grass like say sugar cane or, sugar cane or better yet uh, honey? Um, so sugar cane we have just started fermenting to make a base wine per se out of sugar cane and we have distilled it to make a rum. So we have aged rum for six months with some vanilla, vanilla beans. Um, Standardized quality assurance or quality control um, scheme. And the second part is if yes on the first part, um, whether or not you guys have explored ways to automate the process uh, using like some type of you said titration before, quantifying that, or using some type of like microscopy technique. Yes, the chemistry guy in the room. <laughs> um, yes, we do a lot of quali quality control. Uh, we have one of the most technologically advanced laboratories in the state of Michigan. We actually have more equipment than MSU does for wine analysis of what they're utilizing at the university level. Um, when I started at the, the winery, at St. Julian, the winery I worked for in California had a lot of great technology that they were utilizing. That's been 15 years ago. So we have employed some of that at St. Julian and we're continuing to build on that. Um, where we used to do steam distillations of alcohols that would take anywhere from an hour to a half a day, we purchased a piece of equipment that will give us a readout in two minutes. Um, Great automation, fortunately, it took a person's job position. Um, but we have a more accurate test result and automated it. It makes us better at the winery for knowing that information. Um, titrations, we used to do actual hand titrations with the long, tall burettes. We now have digital burettes. We have an auto titrator now as well. Um, where we were doing everything by hand, now we pretty much, we call it lock and load. We put the samples in, push a button, tell it how many there are, and then it spits out the information at that point. It makes us more accurate on that end as well. Um, chromatography, does anybody ever remember chromatography from okay, school, high school? A lot of wineries will do chromatography for enzymatic, well we do enzymatic analysis, but for malolactic fermentations, so they'll do chromatography or see if their ferments are done. Um, there are also urine tablets that wineries use that is a color test, so it does it, what, what color does it match and they have to hold it up. We run enzymatic analysis so we have a number associated with analysis now. Um, I like numbers, I don't like to guess on things, yes, is it blue, is it light blue, is it kind of aqua green, I like to know, yes, it's 1.0 or it's 0.1 or whatever number that we're shooting for, so definitely. From there, we're also SQF certified. Uh, safe quality food. Almost all suppliers in the grocery store chain now have to be certified with SQF. We worked with a grocery store chain out of New York that pushed us into this audit process. So we are certified with that every single year, which has now helped us in translation work with other large grocers as well as export to Japan and China. Does that answer the first and second part? Yeah, both parts. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, I'm a beer drinker. I drink a lot of beer. And so, so do I. <laughs> and I've enjoyed the last you know, 10 years or more the explosion of microbreweries and, and all the variety and so forth. And um, so it, the wine business, I mean, how, how is it faring? And is, is there any, I know you said is it, wine is an agricultural product and it requires farmland. But is there something like that already going on or the potential for kind of a, a I don't know, explosion of variety like you see with microbreweries? There is an explosion, it's just not as publicized as what the breweries are. Um, 
wineries, we get one chance every year to make our product. We harvest every September and October, and we have one chance. And we have to work with those grapes or raspberries or blueberries, whatever fruit source, all year round. In beer, when they want to make beer, they just order, batch order. Yeah, I need the grain, I need the barley, I need the hops. And they can order it 16 times during the year if they need to. Um, a lot less capital venture that you have needed to get started making beer. Um, a little brewery in Decatur, Michigan, they have you know a little stovetop pot and they're brewing their beer in there. Um, you would never see a startup winery do that, it's nearly impossible. Um, so a, a different business venture, a different business model. Um, the brewing industry is hot right now. There's a lot of press. There are a lot of people reading and writing about it. Um, there's a lot of things going on with the big guys like Anheuser-Busch and you know the conglomeration of you now it's InBev and people buying and selling. That happens in the wine industry too. We just don't advertise it in the same way. Ten new wineries open every year in Michigan. Really? Yes. In the last eight years, ten wineries have opened every year. Not all of them are necessarily still in business, same with breweries, right, but there right. is a boom in the wine industry. The problem that we have, there aren't enough grapes planted in our state to supply all of the wineries to have viable businesses. Right, right. Thank you. Yeah. But a lot of wine is made, or a lot of beer is drank when making good wine, so I can partake in that. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I'm trying to learn about sort of business etiquette and um, sourcing a little. So my question is kind of, um, I guess, what um, do you, does St. Julian's always go out and like solicit and find growers and sources for anything from fruit to labeling? Do you go to um, trade shows or do people come and solicit, do people come and say, I'm growing, you know, organic strawberries or whatever, or I have this kind of label, are you interested? What is the etiquette there that... that both. Uh, we go to trade shows. Uh, Michigan has a wine meeting every year. This actually past year is in Radisson in February. So we travel around the state kind of to each region where the wineries are at to spread the wealth, I guess, uh, around the state of Michigan. Next year it's going to be at the Grand Traverse Resort in Traverse City. Um, so we do have meetings that we all get together, that we have suppliers that come in. Um, people stop by the winery all the time trying to sell us stuff or switch suppliers. I just met with a chemical company last week that they're trying to get into the wine industry, that they buy chemicals in bulk and they were wondering if the wine industry sector would be a good business opportunity for their company. Um, but we also go out and look for things. So by networking within our own industry, we I might talk to a fellow winemaker and they will say, hey, I use this strain of yeast. And I'll say, oh, where'd you source that from? And it might not be the same company that we're utilizing. So I'll reach out to the next company to say, hey, I'm, I'm interested in possibly using this for my next year's ferment. Can I get some information on it? So it kind of goes both ways. A lot of it is networking, but there are definitely people that stop by the winery all the time. I get a ridiculous amount of emails um, for glass supplier, label suppliers. Um, we work with different artists to create different labels for us. Um, people that we've worked with in the past for several years, or someone that had dropped by and, and dropped off some of their artwork, and then we pursued them in that fashion. Uh, grape growers, I actually just had a, a lady uh, contact us because she recently purchased a farm and she wanted to know if we wanted to purchase her grapes. Um, we do work with new growers. Actually, I just signed a new grower that, same scenario, had purchased a farm from a winery um, owner that had sold a piece of land and they wanted to sell their grapes to us. And so we contracted them. But most of our growers have we've been working with for well over 20 years that so they've been working with the winery well before I started at St. Julian. So we have a good core group of growers that we have a good family relationship. So St. Julian's is still a family-owned business. We're third generation, fourth generation just started with us a few years ago. And that's kind of how we relate, not just the employees, but the growers. They're part of our family. We have a wine club. Those people are part of our family. So it's a really neat industry. We are all trying to help each other kind of grow, not within the walls of St. Julian, but within the wine industry altogether. We'd much rather you drink wine than beer, but you know, we drink a lot of beer too, so <laughs> it's a score if we can get a wine drinker, uh, a beer drinker to drink wine, so. 
can you, I know you see your billboards all over and everybody knows what Blue Heron is and stuff, but uh, being a private company, I assume a lot of stuff is confidential, but can you give us any kind of scope as to what the size is either by cases of, of booze or a number of employees or something? Sure. Um, we have 1.5 million gallons of capacity. Uh, we are in the top 50 in the entire United States for size of production. Um, wineries in California are crushing tens of thousands of, of tons of grapes. They're 2,000 pounds in a ton. Um, our largest harvest at St. Julian was 7,000 tons. It's been quite a few number of years since we did that many. Uh, but we are a uh, big little guy in the realm of the wine world. You have your core group of wineries that are huge, that are all based out in California, that are conglomerates of Gallows and the Constellation brands of the world that uh, the majority of the wine that you guys are probably drinking off your grocery store shelves are produced by two different wine companies. Um, they just have 35 different labels and they're all produced by the same people. Um, and then there are the small mom and pop places. So we are large. Uh, we do 250,000 cases of wine and sparkling juice a year. Most wineries in Michigan are doing maybe 10,000. How many employees do you have? We have um, 18 employees in production. Uh, we have six office staff, and then we have two tasting room managers and two wine club, and then some seasonal staff. Plus we have three other tasting room locations. So. Um, we're under 100 altogether, even with temporary or seasonal employees. Yeah. So you said you do a lot of work for uh, like customer discovery and working with them and taste testing and stuff. How do you go about um, finding people they want to volunteer for stuff like that? <laughs> Are you wanting to volunteer? <laughs> Um, a lot of it is customers that come into the tasting room that will just talk if I happen to be up front. Um, I love to kind of be the fly on the wall in the tasting room and people not know that I'm the winemaker because I like a candid response to if they really enjoy the wine. Um, we make 75 different products. I don't expect every single person to like every single thing we make. I personally don't drink everything that we make. Do I taste it? Yeah. Do I know how it tastes and what it should taste like? Of course, it's my job. Um, Blue Heron's a great wine. I always have it at home. I don't go home and loathe for a glass of Blue Heron. I choose other things. Uh, but to listen to our customers, what they have to say. But we also have a, a significant membership with our wine club, and they are driving a lot of what we're doing right now because they are the ambassadors of St. Julian. They are our constant core consumers that are wanting try this wine. Have you guys ever thought about doing that? Email us suggestions. Um, Come in our tasting room. How many of you guys have been to St. Julian? See, not very many of you. We're only like 20 minutes away. Come on over. It's a good experience. Yeah, that's the first step. Come see us. Hey, Nancy, tell them how you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> So the topic of microbrews has come up a, a few times uh, in the Q and A here. So I was just curious, like, how directly do you feel like your company competes with the, these microbreweries popping up all over the state? And also, do you ever specifically make a product with like the hope, like, yeah, this is gonna, this is gonna be the one that takes over on out of people's hands and puts <laughs> this one into theirs instead? Uh, we view microbreweries as more of a partnership. Um, our owner is Dave Raganini. He's very good friends with Larry Bell. Um, we've coordinated on several projects in the past. Um, there potentially may be several projects in the future uh, coming as well. Um, but it's just such a different industry. I mean, I think the coolest part of having the wine industry and the, the beer industry is when they're very close together. In Papa, we had the Papa Brewery and we have St. Julian. Um, their production facility, Papa Brewery, is like literally down the street from us. Not the little brew pub that you can go and eat at, but where they actually are brewing the beer. And so a lot of times, it's great. There'll be carfuls of couples and the women will come to the winery and the guys will go to the brewery. And it's a one-stop shop to make everybody happy. Um, we personally aren't going to be brewing beer under the roof of St. Julian anytime in the near future. Uh, just something that we're a winery, we're winery based, that's what our love and our passion is. I think the biggest thing that's connecting the microbrew industry and the wine industry right now is cider. 
because both entities can make it under the laws of Michigan. And so you have a lot of breweries that are making some really neat ciders that are very beer-like. And then the wine industry that's making a lot of, you know, the fruitier style, fruit-infused ciders. But they're very similar and they meet a lot of people's palates. So when the husbands come into the winery too, we see them gravitate towards our ciders or our spirits. Not to say guys don't drink wine because there are many of them that do because they're all winemakers. Um, but it's a good fusion between the two, I think. And there's a lot of teamwork going on. A lot of the breweries are utilizing port barrels, um, whiskey barrels from the spirits industry. So I think there's a lot of compliment. It, it's good to go from winery to brewery. It's hard to go from brewery back to winery because the bugs that the breweries like, we don't in a winery. Like we don't like Pertanomyces or Acetobacter or Lactobacillus and all those funky and sour beers that the microbreweries are making. That's what causes that. So it's good to go that way and we just don't want it back into the winery. But it's fun to see them kind of complement each other. You, you hit it. I was going to say, tell them how um, uh, the awards thing, Julian, they've gotten. Or awards? Yeah, especially mm -hmm. the degrees. Um, Teasters Guild International is a um, organization that people that enjoy wine, there'll be a, a Teasters Guild chapter. We actually have one here in Kalamazoo. But there's a competition that Teasters Guild International runs. We just were entered in it and we entered 18 wines, all 18 medal. Um, we participate in invitationals that we're asked to participate in. It's not just any winery can send their wines, and we've done very good of those in the past, winning some Jefferson Cups. Um, but we take pride in what we do, and I think it showcases itself in the wine. And I don't know. Okay. We just got nine gold medals out of the 18 wines that we entered, which is kind of unheard of from wineries. So. Oh. California. We drink yeah. California. Yes. No, the Cal. You enter wines in California contest. Yes. We won the best Riesling in the world. Yeah. Uh, we won the best the East versus West challenge. I don't like to talk about this segment because it's having the name wine named after me. Um, but I guess I should be proud. We are uh, the East versus the West. There's a Eastern International Wine Competition and the West Coast Wine Competition. And they picked the best top wines from each of the competitions and then had a whole other competition and compared them to each other. And we won not just the best Riesling, but the best white wine in the entire scenario, both competitions. So um, we're a little winery in Michigan, but we can hold our own in the international wine world. So we're quite proud of that. Is there a recent law change to get to where you're able to do distilling now, or? Oh, legislation is such a challenge in this state. Um, we have crazy laws here in Michigan. So after Prohibition, it was deemed that each state could have their own law of how they regulate alcohol. And we have very strict laws here. For us to produce spirits, 85% of the retail value goes back to the state in Texas. So if you sell a bottle of spirits for 10 bucks, $8.50 goes back to the state. Wow. Um, very crazy, oh very lucrative to the state. Um, so we're constantly trying to change that. Of course, the legislators don't want to because that's how they get paid. Um, and that's how a lot of money is going back to the state for different things. But we, they have changed it that they, it has been reduced. Um, and a lot of that is being driven not just by Michigan, but by the U.S. producers. So there's a U.S. Distillers um, Association. It just got actually reduced for cider production because there's a U.S. Cider Production um, or U.S. Cider Association. So if all of the cider makers and all of the wineries and all the distilleries come together as a force against the beer and wine wholesalers, essentially, um, things do get changed. So there was a law, wineries could produce vodka and call it vodka. We could make it, but we couldn't call it vodka. So that's been changed. So now we can make the vodkas and the gins and the rums. That's why you're seeing Round Barn Winery come out with different things. They just came out with the tequila as well. We can do that now. Um, but yeah, the laws are ever changing, but they're very strict and lucrative um, in this state. <laughs> I'll come back up here. All right. So, <laughs> So with the very interesting question, so with 
the boom in the wine industry. Um, how do you see that, especially for women or for, for uh, future winemakers? I mean, do you go back to Purdue or do you, do you, do you see, um, what do you see in the future? Who's coming? Um, I think there's always opportunity. Um, with new wineries just means growth and chance for new people coming into the industry. Uh, Purdue, of course, because, you know, whether I'm a boilermaker, I believe, black and gold. But MSU is a great resource. Uh, here in Kalamazoo, Western has a now a, a brewing program that they're starting. Lake Michigan College recently hired a gentleman out of Walla Walla, California, and they have a winemaking program at um, LMC down in Benton Harbor. And all of these universities are actually working with the VESTA program, which is Viticulture and Enology Science and Technology Alliance. Um, and there are nine states that are involved with it. So if a student at, let's say, Southwest Michigan College, being more of a community college, wanted to get into this, they could work with professors at UC Davis or work with professors at Missouri State or work with professors at Michigan State to gain experience through distance learning, per se, um, to, to learn about winemaking, and then they rely on the actual industry to help facilitate that. So they're actually coming to St. Julian to get intern experience. They're going out with the growers to get growing experience. So as we grow as an industry, we want educated people. We don't want, you know, a Joe Schmo coming in, which it's very easy to train people, but someone that has a background or has the interest or has, you know, some sort of science knowledge versus um, a teaching background would be quite beneficial in the wine industry. Well, is there anything else that you haven't been asked that <laughs> you want, but you would like the audience to know? Come to the winery. We're not that far away. It's a great experience. Southwest Michigan is beautiful, especially in the fall. Um, if you drive out towards Pawpaw, literally the air smells like grapes. You can actually smell the concords as they ripen in the air, which is absolutely amazing. Something that you don't get in California. Um, concords are actually quite aromatic. But come to wine country. I mean, we have our own little wine country right here in our backyard in Michigan. Traverse City gets a lot of press about what they're doing up there. They literally are a little Napa up there. I think we're more like Sonoma down in Southwest Michigan, but it's truly beautiful of what our state produces. Not just wineries, but the breweries and there's farmers markets and we are in a fruit belt. There are 350 different fruits and vegetables that can be grown in the world and Michigan can grow 85% of them. It's insane of what we're doing here, and I don't think people really realize that. So being right here in Southwest Michigan, it's gorgeous. If you go up a little bit north of Pawpaw in the Bangor area, it's blue country, as we call it, blueberry country, over to South Haven. But it's pretty neat um, what we have going on here. You guys are nice and close to the Bank Street Market, so I know they bring you guys the fruits and vegetables, but get on out there to what this beautiful state has to offer. How about a round of applause? Thank you. Thank you. It was very enjoyable. <laughs> Would you make it an asparagus wine? Um, we don't make asparagus wine, but there is a winery, Fox Barn, that yeah. does make asparagus wine. Wow. <laughs> and asparagus, they do make I, it. I said, have you had it? I have had it. It tastes just like asparagus. <laughs> 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 it would be good to cook with, personally. I love asparagus. Um, but asparagus <laughs> season is just starting. A lot of the farm markets are opening with asparagus. I know Schultz's just opened yesterday, so they're in Madawan. There's nothing like it being fresh picked right there. So, thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you.